Okay, good morning and welcome. Um, I'm retired Brigadier General Mike Newton from the Air Force. Uh, I now work for LSI. And uh, so being retired from the Air Force means that I shopped at Athens for a lot of years. Okay, and so we're really happy to bring you uh, this outreach today with APES. APES, of course, stands for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. And I'm not going to steal a lot of the thunder, but of course, there's hundreds of locations across the country. So there's a lot of opportunity here, so we're excited to bring this to you. Um, did you do that or did I do that? You did. You're going to blame it on me. <laughs> Okay, a couple of uh, administrative stuff before we get started. Uh, you probably already noticed that we couldn't get the restrooms any closer to you, right? Uh, right out here to the right, and then there's more down the hall. Okay, and um, we are recording this today because there's a lot of interest from southern Utah uh, companies there who couldn't make the trip up, so we are recording this. Um, Okay, and I hope most of you received a parking pass and stuck it in your windshield out there, right, so you don't get a parking ticket, right? Everybody's good? Okay, and uh, make sure that you are registered. If you were just a drop-in today, make sure that we have your information because the charts that you're going to see, you don't have to be taking copious notes. Uh, we're going to send those to you electronically. Um, at the end of today, okay? And the other thing I want to point out is that ATS is very comfortable with, in fact, prefers questions um, during the presentation. I mean, they got a chart up there that you've got a question on, grab them right then, okay? Uh, that's a lot better than waiting until the end and having to pull that chart back up. So feel free to ask questions as we go. Okay, I think that was all the admin stuff. Um, okay, so we are uh, very proud of our partnership with uh, PTAC. Uh, together we're called the PTAC team. And today uh, we have, I'll let Chuck introduce uh, his uh, regional managers that are in the audience, but Chuck Spence is the director of the Utah PTAC. Uh, and also the recent past president of APTAC, which is the association of PTACs, which means the PTACs across the country. Uh, just recently. Uh, Stepped down or retired? Yeah, I was looking <laughs> for the right word. Uh, was that a two-year assignment? Or? Uh, president elect and then president now. I'm the immediate past president. Yeah, okay. Um, so, uh, very proud of our relationship and uh, proud to introduce Chuck. And not only that, he's a University of Utah football fan. Season tickets holders. Yes. Four years. And that season starts tomorrow. That's good. Yeah. So please welcome Chuck Spence. Thank you. Do you need this, or can you, can you all hear me? Yeah, I think I have a good mic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so Mike and I are, are seasoned football players <laughs> over the years, so we have, we have a lot to talk about this time of year. And uh, I'm just a college football fan, so if there's BYU or Utah State folks <laughs> in the audience, hey, thumbs up. Football is here, and we're excited. So good luck to the Cougars Saturday against uh, Arizona, and good luck to the Utes uh, tomorrow against SUU. Well, I'm thrilled to be here today, and you know, it's I was I was doing a little vacation last month in July, so I missed the uh, MCC event. Uh, Pete uh, took care of that uh, for us, but it's great to be out. It's great to welcome our friends from AFES, both from Dallas and, and the local folks here. We'll get to, into that a little bit more. So I think this should work. There it goes. Okay. Uh, next slide. So as Mike mentioned, uh, we are the, as you know, the PTAC, the Procurement Technical Assistance Centers, and Utah is a statewide program. There's about 97 PTACs throughout the country, and we do one thing only. We are here as a resource to you, the small businesses, of course, here in Utah and across the country, to help you <coughs> go after government contracts, and that's our role. 
PTAC has got, has got uh, a lot of changes recently, and I want to tell you a little bit about some of those changes that we've made. Uh, PTAC is a program under the Governor's Office of Economic Development, so we're a business development tool. And this is kind of the, the leadership for, for, for you BYU fans out there. You might recognize our executive director, Mr. Val Hale. He was formerly the athletic director for BYU. I'm saying, Johnny, help me out, 15, 15, 18 years ago, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, our deputy director, Teresa Foxley, is an attorney. She came over from uh, Ballard Spar. Uh, Becky Varela was uh, Mike Levitt, a former governor. Uh, she was, I believe, the press secretary for Mike Levitt. And just recently, if you saw the papers about uh, four or five days ago, uh, she was uh, she was named as like the forget the title, but she was named as the as the as one of the the best, or uh, she won the award for the best uh, tourism and film uh, organization throughout the country this year. So we're very pleased to have her. And my boss is Mr. Ben Hart. And he's a, he's a division director over uh, urban and rural business services for GOAD. And of course, we have Jill, who uh, runs our internal operations for GOAD. As I mentioned, some changes. Uh, last April, we made some transitions within our office. Uh, our former director, Fred Lane, transitioned into another position within GOAD. And they asked me if I would uh, take over the, uh, the leadership and management of the, of the PTAC program. And I'm pleased, I'm more pleased than I can possibly tell you that uh, I now have a full staff. Trying to do three jobs at once was uh, a little bit overwhelming for a couple of months. Uh, I brought on uh, Mr. Keith uh, Christensen. Keith, if you stand up. All right, Keith. Keith is, uh, <laughs> he's just my deputy director and deputy director of the PTAC program. Uh, he hails out of uh, Northern California, where he works in the PTAC and was the program manager down there. Uh, formerly, you may, some of you may remember him, he uh, was a regional manager down in the St. George area uh, for PTAC since about 2009. So we're glad to have Keith on board. Also, uh, during this transition, they took away my administrative assistant, or at that time Fred's administrative assistant, and then mine. Uh, Missy, and so for about two months, uh, I was I was running the show in Salt Lake, and I'm pleased to have Miss Kirsten Anderson. Kirsten, would you please stand up? Mm -hmm. Kirsten keeps us all organized, and we're thrilled to have her. Uh, and then the, the rest of the staff here, some are of course not here because they're down in Cedar City and St. George, uh, but we have Mr. Alex Quaisensaki with us. Alex. Covers Morgan, Davis, and Weaver counties. Then we have who's next on the list there? We have uh, Cam, he's in St. George, Cindy Roberts, uh, uh, Logan, uh, Joni covers Cedar City area, and then Johnny Wilkinson. Johnny, want to give us a wave or stand up? Covers uh, South Salt Lake, West Valley, and Tooele areas, and then uh, uh, Mr. Steve Line. Steve. We cover Utah County and about what? 15, 15 others. <laughs> we are right in the middle of recruiting for a part time PTAC person, and that will be housed in the Price area, and he or she will be uh, part of the Utah State University Eastern campus up there and will uh, eventually take over most of the eastern part of Utah. So about a month ago, uh, we pulled our staff together and spent a day down in Utah County about to, to, help, to help us get organized, help us kind of focus on what it is that PTAC wants to do. And our mission statement, as you can see, is that PTAC goal is to help uh, small businesses succeed in the government in the, in the, in the government work, uh, workplace, and it is our goal to do everything we can to be knowledgeable and to provide wonderful, great, whatever adjective you want to use, customer service to your clients. So that is our mission statement. 
our purpose is to be the premier source. When you when people think, gosh, how do I do business with fill in for space? Or how do I find a procurement? How do I find an opportunity? What if I want to do business with Salt Lake County or APs? Where do I turn to? Because governments is big monolith, but how, how do I even get to step one? Or how do I get the second base on that? Well, you want to turn to PTAC, and the PTAC team is going to take you by the hand, and we're going to do everything we can to try to help you win those government contracts. This is not uh, all inclusive, but uh, represents a few of our, I would say, our top goals. We want to provide outstanding customer service to you. And we didn't have a chance to really try to put down the measure goals, but certainly one would be, and, and I'm trying to do work I, 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 I've got to get better. But our goal is we'll give you a phone call, an email. We want to get back to you either same day or within, you know, within 24 hours. I'm getting better at that. I'm still sometimes two or three days behind my emails. But that's our goal, is to do everything that we can to provide great customer service. One of those steps, of course, has to do with our staff being trained and knowledgeable on federal procurement. And to that end, one of the things that I did as soon as I moved into the, the director position was to put together a formal training program for all of our staff. And we use a company called Gumpology. They're out of uh, Seattle. Now, the, the, uh, the owner and the CEO of that company is a former PTAC counselor who also has a lot of years of experience in, uh, in the federal, federal procurement side. And he has online training. So our staff can now go online and take these trainings 24-7 at their convenience. And it's literally written in their performance plan to be able to perform or, or, or take a certain amount of those classes. So we want to be knowledgeable for you, and we want to be there for you. We want to be able to take that knowledge and then teach you how to market to the federal government. Uh, there are there are techniques to use, and there are ways that are more successful than are not, and that's uh, one of our goals. Here two four, we used to just do one annual survey once a year. We thought that's not good enough. We want your feedback. We want to know how we're doing. We want to know what you want. Is there certain types of outreach that you want? And you, you asked, and I know Mike mentioned this, you asked for APs Dallas, APs National come out. And so we, we, we were responsible for that. So we said we're going to do that. And so we asked our partners at LSI, part of the feedback team, to do that. And Mike led the way. So Mike, thank you for, for your great efforts and bringing up the great folks from APs out today. So that's one of the things that uh, we want to do. We'll do it quarterly. They're not going to be long, probably four or five questions. And I've asked Steve Lines to kind of spear, uh, spear up that, uh, lead that effort. And then lastly, uh, it's coming soon. I'm going to ask uh, Keith uh, Christensen, my deputy, to uh, take the lead in our monthly newsletters. And so this will not just be a, a calendar of events that you'll get. But this will also be, we'll have uh, articles and information on federal procurement, things that have been posted on the, the National Federal Register, things that we get from contract, government contract attorneys. For example, you know, the issue right now is if you're a woman-owned small business, there's a little bit of a, we're in legal limbo. On one side, Congress said you will get registered as a woman-owned small business by a third party. SBA saying, oh, we're still going to accept self-certification. So our, our the, I say our, the APTAC, our national attorney that we consult with, he said, you know, when Congress says something, that pretty much supersedes it. So I think you will see eventually SBA coming around and the administration coming around and saying, Okay, but you're going to need third-party third party certification. So those are going to be the kind of articles that we hope to get out to you, keep you informed on, on uh, government procurement. Uh, we have updated our website. We've kind of put a new face to it. Uh, Keith uh, has, has uh, in, in two, three weeks that he's taken on that assignment, has done a, just a masterful job on that. I want to thank Keith personally for doing that. And so we want you uh, to visit that website. 
And one of the pages on that website is this one. So wherever you are in our 29 counties in Utah, you'll be able to just click on that county where you're from, and you'll be able to know who the regional manager is that covers that. Yes, sir. Do you like the website? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. 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 And speaking of our calendar of events, uh, next month we have uh, GSA. Is Terry or I here? Okay. Uh, they'll be conducting. Uh, and Steve, is it, is, it, is it going to be both of them or just Terry? Or? Well, yeah. On September 19th, uh, out in Steve's area at uh, UVU in Orem. Uh, and then on October 20th is the big PPAC event. Usually we do a full blown symposium with all the changes and transitions that we made this year. We decided to scale it down a little bit. But we are having a big vendor there. And we hope to have 45 to 50 vendors from government agencies, federal, Department of Defense, uh, JD. JD, by the way, let me introduce you. This is James King, the <coughs> Small Business Director for Hill Air Force Base. James. <laughs> we have a wonderful relationship with JD, and he and his staff will be there at the vendor fair, among others. We'll have Dugway and BLM and Forest Service. Uh, cities and counties, school districts, universities, and large prime defense contractors. Think Orbital 8, PK, L3. Who am I missing, who am I missing there, Steve? Uh, BAE. 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 Uh, and Bremen, among others. So you won't want to miss that. Put that on your calendar. Here, to register for any of these upcoming events and see the calendar events, you go to that website. There it is. And it's very easy for you. And then speaking of that, uh, what you have in front of you, if I can just borrow that for a minute, you have a flyer, uh, again, the, the save the date flyer for our uh, CAT vendor fair. So take that home, put that on your uh, calendar of work, and please plan for him. Cost is free. There's no cost to, to you coming, so we're going to absorb the cost on that one. And then we'll end the year on November 15th with doing business, how to do business with uh, Hill Air Force Base 101. And Marianne Flinders from JD's office will be there to give that presentation. And that will be at Go Red. Yes, sir. What is the location for that November 5th, uh, 15th meeting? Uh, here, November 5th, will be at the Governor's Office of Economic Development's Office, downtown Salt Lake, in the World Trade Center. And uh, you just contact your, your, what is our address? 60 East South Temple, third floor. You go to the website to click on that registration link, and it'll give you a map Absolutely. And I think that's a question. Yeah. Yes, sir. On the uh, Provo uh, vendors, it's only going to be vendors that are doing business with the, uh, with the government or <clears throat> primarily. I mean, that's what PTAC does. We, we you know, it's, it's you know, business to government is kind of our model. So uh, we, we will have a few like the uh, University of Utah's medical center, University of Utah healthcare, healthcare, uh, well, University of Utah purchasing department, hopefully DYU, but it will be primarily government centric, yes. But I'll, I'll do the let's say, I'm the business of the government still, but I can have a booth if I log in. Uh, the, the booth exhibitors, great question. The booth exhibitors will be the, you know, the, the government agencies, federal, state, local. Uh, and so this is an opportunity for, for you all as small businesses to network with those booth exhibitors, exchange information, tell them your story, tell them what you buy, and then to follow up and probably a follow up meeting sometime subsequent to that. Okay. Any other questions? If not, um, you're here not to hear me, you're here to, to hear the folks from AB, so we'll turn my back over to Mike to introduce. But uh, lastly, before I do that, let me just say, say a personal thank you to Shelly, Shelly, Mark, Mark, Denise, Dan, and Susan, uh, who came all again from Dallas and from the, the local area. So thank you so much for coming. And Mike, would you like to introduce you? Okay. Okay. Yes. <laughs> So I always like to, and Chuck, for your benefit, how many in here are PCAT clients? Okay, 
in. How many are not? Okay, so we're always hoping they get some new uh, PTAC clients. Uh, it's a great service, uh, no cost to you. Uh, I love their bid match system, which should be delivering bids to your inbox every day. You just click on that link and open it up. So, so you add um, the other one? Let us keep going. Okay, I also like to. Um, or do we need to? Okay, just we just we introduced uh, the PCAC folks and we introduced uh, JD, who runs a small business office at Hill Air Force Base. Um, I'm going to introduce Shelly, and then she's going to introduce uh, her staff. But uh, Doug Fridley is our program manager from LSI. <laughs> Sandy Sloan is one of our consultants with LSI. And then behind the curtain over here is Laurie and Forrest. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to try to do uh, a quick introduction. Uh, that's what Shelly wants. Okay. Uh, although, looking at your resume, I see all these different jobs. You don't seem to be able to hang on to a job. Yeah. Hi. 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 sitting on your raise your hand. Hi. I'm glad you snuck in. Okay, so um, so they sent one of the uh, I'll, I'll try, I'm using the word boys. They sent one of the big boys, okay, for this one. Uh, okay, when, when, when Shelly throws up her uh, regional map of Aethys, you'll see that almost the whole western half of the United States is her responsibility. So, uh, Shelly uh, Armstrong is the senior vice president of the western region for Aethys. Uh, she plans, develops, and oversees execution of corporate business strategies, procedures, and programs. Uh, headquartered in Dallas, um, and, and again, I don't want to steal the thunder too much, $8.5 billion a year, so they got a little bit of business coming in. Uh, they employ about 35,000 associates, and um, they operate in lots of states and lots of countries, and again, that's in her briefing. So, um, Shelly was born in Wichita, Kansas. She started her career as a college trainee at Eastler Air Force Base in Mississippi. Which, by the way, is where I was born. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. Uh, my dad was in the Air Force. In fact, uh, between my dad and I, we have been shopping at APs for 70 years. <laughs> so, uh, loyal customer, right? <laughs> uh, so yeah, I was I was born in the uh, base hospital on Keesler Air Force Base. Uh, she saw a variety of positions. Um, uh, military clothing manager, operations manager, sales and merchandise manager, store manager. Uh, I mean, just it's numerous jobs. She's uh, well-rounded. <laughs> um, prior to her current position, she was the vice president of marketing and advertising and the market, marketing director um, at the, uh, the western for the western region. And she was promoted to her current position uh, this year, in February. So congratulations on that. She has a, a, a bachelor's and a master's degree in uh, management. So please help me welcome Jill Armstrong. Yes. You don't need them. Okay, you don't need this one? No. Okay. <laughs> um, as Mike said, um, I've been with the Exchange 27 years, various jobs. I think I would be difficult for me to find one that I like and one that I was good at. So hopefully I found the right mark this point in time. Again, as Mike said earlier, if you have questions, please ask as we go along. We're actually making a little bit more comfortable up here because I feel like I'm preaching to you or giving you a sermon and it's not truly the title yet. So <laughs> <laughs> I apologize for that. Um, did, how, how many of you have done this with the exchange or know our history or done who we are? Okay, and we'll start fresh here. Um, the exchange was brought into uh, 19, 1895. Um, the General Order 46 directed all 
post exchanges, post commanders to establish an exchange store. And in 1946, we became the Army Air Force Exchange Service. So we've been 120 years this year. So we had a birthday in August. We turned 121. We were in 50, all 50 states and 32 countries. We've taken part in 14 military events, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, Iran, all the conflicts we have been involved in. So again, our logo, we go where you go, is truly, we do truly do that. Let's see here. That's a little bit of the agenda on that. And really quickly, I apologize here. We've got Mark Downs, who is general manager for the Hill Exchange. Susan Pete, she's a service business manager for the Hill Exchange. Denise Downman, who's based out of Dallas, is the chief of banking and services. Dan Codlin is the division merchandising manager out of Dallas. So they'll help me with some expertise on the organization. Again, as we were talking, we are global. As I said, all 50 states and 32 countries. As he said, I have a Western half of the United States. So those oranges and greens on this side is what I'm responsible for. And then I have three pairs that oversee the central of the United States and the East Coast. And then we have one senior vice president and then overseas our comments. This is our customer base. We, again, we are about the military and the family members. As you see, a large percentage of our customer base is based in the same year, 28%. I am an Air Force brat, an Army wife, an Army mother, and this is an Army grandmother. Our oldest grandmother is going to Army. So, like Mike, I have been a dedicated customer my entire life. Then again, the retirees, which is 22% of our customer base, 13% active duty, Guard and Reserve is 10%. And civilian, that population is children under 10, and those that are given authorization to shop our exchange, especially those located overseas. Again, here as we talk about we go when you go, we're the only organization where people actually volunteer to go from Tom's way. These associates that go down range and volunteer, go volunteer. They want to be there. They want to make sure we're there where the troops are at, giving them a little piece of home. So that number is a little bit off. It's actually about 4,500 have deployed since uh, 2000, um, September 11th. So it's a lot. Not all of these can say people will actually raise their hand and say, I want to go into the combat zone to make sure that those service units are being taken care of. We are the number one employer of wounded warriors besides the Department of Defense, 843, and we continue to make that a priority. Our belief is that once you return to a country, you should have an opportunity to get another job once you retire. So we go after that with all part on that. 1.5 million in combat uniforms. We are the only company authorized to sell combat uniforms, so therefore at least we're, we're, we're it. This is where they're going to get what they need to take care of that country. We have 25,000 facilities worldwide, 1,400 fast service retail, uh, food service businesses, 3,300 concessions. So we cover retail, food, services, and all business areas on that. So I think that should get pretty much everybody in this room some opportunity for interacting you know, with the exchange. Seven plants, those are all overseas, where we do bread, water, Bread, water, we actually just opened up the Krispy Kreme plant also in Germany. And we also provide all the real ones to the new school that overseas. This is the exchange by the numbers. It pretty much tells our, our story here. Again, as Mike mentioned, 8.5 billion in sales and in, in, in revenue, excuse me, combat uniforms. 88% of our associates are connected with more than one way, shape, or form. And that's a number we're very proud of because of our children family serving family. It truly is that family serving family. Again, the associates have deployed the wounded warriors to 25,000 facilities. Earnings was 402 million, but if you notice that the dividends, 237 of that, we give right back to the installation that we're on. 97% of our, we are 97% funded. The 3% that is appropriate from is funding for our overseas operations. So what we make, we put back into the facilities. The daycares, uh, golf courses, gyms, all of that is based on the dividend that we give back to the installations that we um, generate sales on. Credit card holder, again, that's an opportunity for our young soldiers to develop a credit base. You cannot be anything without credit in the world today. So this is an entry point into that, that world of credit, and it helps them teach them to manage their, their money. Again, we talked about the school lunches, the plants we in 50 states and 33 countries. And that's just a repeat of that. And I want to go a little bit fast. 
But I think it's important to understand that we are in the community, we're a part of the community, and we understand our role in the community. And it's, it is about family, so the family is going to be on what we want to be and how we grow that business and ensure that they're getting the quality of life in the States and that we're able to be what they are in the gallery. There's nothing more important to an 18 year old, 19 year old, 20 year old, so now I can go get a Pepsi or a Snickers in the middle of the Iraq desert. That I can get that piece of home. I can get a hamburger, that's what I want. And that is really what we strive for in that. We do that on a local level, and we do that on the global level here too. So again, this interactive for us, you can see, you understand, we do a lot of things here that we get angry with, but the people from the headquarters and my staff, we can probably assist to you on giving you a better understanding of how you can work with us on a global basis. And it might just be the only one here, the western part of the United States or the central part of the United States, or even the eastern part of the United States, we can give you that avenue to communicate with those people in that. The staff that I have on my team is duplicated in all three of our business regions here. You know, we have our our uh, service business managers, our three business managers, and then my counterparts here too. So again, ask questions as we go through it. Then we don't understand and want to understand because that's when we look for that. Okay. Any questions? And we'll talk a little bit. I'll take a coffee after that. Yes, sir. So um, when you start with people, there are that the people that are interested in this is you know, mm -hmm. so kind of a piece of home to your uh, family members mm -hmm. through that program. You would have a list of what we need or what would be in these languages or how does it work? Depends on what business you're in. Are you talking about as far as a service? No, or product. Pro product. 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 product in particular. I mean, again, depends on what the product is. A lot of that more than likely would be here in the United States, not necessarily downwind. It would be your initial footprint into that. Well, it's a cost. So, okay. so how would that work? Yeah. Now, are you trying to get the line throughout the whole organization, or are you trying to set up to uh, test the waters for a little bit? Is what you're trying to say? Well, yeah, we're small, so okay. testing is always better. Okay. We've so that would probably be something that would be local, since you're on the concession card to see how that works for you, and then give you the opportunity to understand that it works for us, and then find this one selection throughout the week. And it's a, it's, it's a conversation that could be waters. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, mm -hmm. We get feedbacks from we get from ECEs to get feedbacks on uh, the customers or what else will be needing or are we fulfilling yes. their needs. Yes, it's a free form of information and conversation on anybody that we interact with, just so you know whether it was successful or we can try something a little bit different or it just doesn't know what the customer was looking for. So yes, it's a free form of information back and forth. Thank you. Can I just uh, mention something? You, can we have you stand when you have a question so not everybody can hear? Oh. Then I'm going to grab the mic and maybe we can kind of pass it around <laughs> okay. so everybody can hear. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. His question was, how to get into the business? Would we start small or be something global? <clears throat> recommendation was probably to test it out locally, see how it works, and then if there's an opportunity to expand it to other installations, it probably would not be something that would initially go into our oak points operations. Oh, I'm sorry. I use, we, use we use acronyms all the time. They're reminding me that I can call the whole conversation an acronym. If I want to say Oakland, it's like overseas operations. I apologize. And Conant is a continental United States. Sorry. I wrote Oakland. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's second nature when we don't realize that we have our own radio. We can actually hold a whole conversation and never say a real word. So that's our, we learned that from the military. What can we say? Yeah. It's a quicker way to get the information through. So, you have anything that you're probably more interested in what Denise and Dan have to say, so I'm going to turn it over to them and they can walk you through the process of doing business with us on our website. <laughs> Thank you, Shelley. So we are very proud to be here today and join all of you. And thank you again to LSI, PTAC, and the Utah Governor's Office for inviting us here today. It's been special to bring the client from Dallas and talk to each of you. And I want to first say congratulations to each of you in this room who are small businesses or medium businesses. That's a tough place to be in the world, but a good place to be. And we're happy to present you an opportunity to do business with the exchange. And we'll go into some of the details 
if you're interested in learning how we do business with the exchange. So if you think, how many of you have ever been on an exchange and seen a BX or a PX? Okay, so most of you in here. But there's some hands who have never been there. So I'm actually going to start at the base level and do the basics for BX and PX that Shelly just introduced overall for us globally. What I do for the company is I talk to main brand businesses and find retailer tenants to come into our shopping centers around the world. I work in conjunction with services business managers like Susan here at Hill Air Force Base in Utah. And we have a services business manager in all of our sites and locations around the world. So this is an opportunity for you as small businesses, not only to work in Utah, but to work in other states and globally, as Shelly said. So we have an outreach person at each site that can work with you and talk to you about setting up in some of your channels of business. What Dan and I are going to do today is talk to you about the different channels of business we have with the exchange. Because there's lots of channels. We can spend an entire day with you talking about different ways to do business. Each of you has a different category or a different line item of business to sell to the exchange or come in as a retailer in the exchange or come in as a support service contractor. So we're going to go through some of that with our slides. But if you enter into a military installation, I want you to think of military installations as a city within a city. They have a mayor, just like a regular city when you're doing business, and that mayor is the installation commander. APHIS, the Army Air Force Exchange Service, or known as the Exchange, is the retail community on the military installation, and we are a retail tenant. We outreach to other retail tenants and wholesalers and suppliers to come and do business with us. So that's how you look at the installation itself. So there's lots of little cities for you to come in and do business with on all of these military installations. I'm happy to say that you've already got GSA contracts with PTAC. We're going to go through some things that are a little different for the exchange. These are the federal agency requirements most of you comply with to go with PTAC. With the Army Air Force Exchange Service, we operate a little differently, and some of those requirements do not apply. FAR does not apply to the exchange. You don't have to be certified to come to the exchange to do business. We have opportunities where we can talk directly to you without some of those certifications and requirements. So these, I think you all have probably talked in many previous briefings, so I'm just going to quickly go over that slide. And these are what it's, what's required to become a retailer with the exchange. So we're not appropriated fund instrumentality, as Shelly said. We use very few tax dollars, and we create dividends to turn back to the military communities on the installations. So supplier certifications are not mandatory to come and do business with us, and we're going to go through individual channels. What we'll give you today is the first step of what you need to complete to get in the business database for conducting business with the exchange, and that's our source list application. So one thing we pride ourselves in as a company is we recognize diverse suppliers. It doesn't matter who you are, what type of business you are, we will look at you. Because we are global, we look at small businesses, women-owned, minority-owned. We pride ourselves in the number of veterans employed by the exchange, as well as the number of veteran-owned businesses that we do business with. So anyone and everyone can do business with the exchange if you have the right product, the right service, and the right niche for the organization to step into. These are some of the mandatory requirements that we do if we have certifications. This slide actually shows some mandatory requirements for us if it's a business of $5,000 or less. And so, again, we'll pay attention to this, but for the most part, as the exchange looks at business, we treat every business equally across the enterprise and across the organization. So again, we're supplier diversity. You can visit www.aphis.com. That will actually defer you to our new exchange website because we are at shopmyexchange.com. So that's the website I'd recommend each of you take note of today. And that's where you'll find information about doing business with the exchange. So let's, this is the part I think most of you want to hear about. How do I do business with the exchange? There's an application process called source list application. At the end of this brief, what we'll do is we'll actually take you to our website shopmyexchange.com and walk you through. Because most of you in the room, I understand, are mid-sized and small business entrepreneurs who want to understand how to do that process. Question on that, please. Yes, sir. Yeah, I got a big mouth coming, Kylie, so I don't need that. Um, okay, so uh, this, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first step in doing business <clears throat> with Athens. So I'm going to put stop that. Even if you go see Susan at the uh, local APs, she's going to hand you a source list application. Okay. Now, Denise, online, uh, you have that, and it says you can do it electronically or you can do it manually and then mail it in. Now, obviously, if you mail it in, you can also send brochures and that type of stuff from your company. Um, in fact, I think yes. maybe your very next chart talks about sending those brochures. So. Um, do you recommend 
uh, one way or the other. I mean, should they do electronic and then send in the brochures? Or, I mean, in either case, doesn't it end up with the particular buyer who buys their product? What will happen, that's correct, what will happen with the source list applications, whether you do electronically or in print, we like to make it open for everybody because not every company feels comfortable doing it electronically. We found we've given some very small businesses and we're open to them as well. So basically what will happen is it will come to our corporate level as a company and then it will be farmed out to the group within the organization that's going to take care of that. So between myself and Dan, we actually represent two primary channels of retail at the exchange. So our groups will take the majority of those. I take care of, as the director of the shopping centers, I do third party tenants and coming into our malls, which we're going to get into that in just a moment as well. Dan takes care of the retail box, which is like the extra deals where we purchase and wholesale everything. We do wholesale purchases for there. And then we directly uh, do business with individual companies, which he's going to talk about in a few more minutes for you. So it's two models, and that's one of about 10 models that we'll get to that you can do business with the exchanges, depending what your niche in the marketplace is. So if you're a service provider, it'll go over to our support service contracting group. And we'll come into some of that as we continue to build. Okay, and the last point uh, I'll make on that, if you print this thing off on uh, the website, don't let us carry it. It's eight pages long, okay, but it's not that bad. The last four pages are simply listing all these bases where they have a base exchange or a post exchange, and you're checking the ones you're interested in selling to. Or the first entry on those four pages is, okay, I want to sell to all of them. So the last four pages really quick. And if you need any help on filling that out, uh, we're available to help. And what I'd suggest, one thing I want to point out to you is the exchange gets hundreds of these source list applications a day. So you will not necessarily get an immediate response. So I don't want to set you up for a false expectation. When you come in, we look at those. And if there's an niche we're looking for, we'll go into it. But again, take note, I'm mentioning the number of channels of doing business with us. So just because you can't come in immediately and sell to our entire, entire global enterprise, you may want to start locally with Susan at Hill, particularly since you're in Utah right now, and it's convenient for most of you since you're headquartered here. Then you can start with the kiosk program that we'll talk about. You can start with doing some direct sales to customers yourselves as small businesses, or providing direct services for the Hill Air Force Base Exchange. Because we are a retail tenant on Hill Air Force Base, everything you do drives into that local community and installation. So, <clears throat> dues. Send your product brochure for your merchandise or products. You can do that and send that to us at headquarters as we get further into the conversation. Once the source of this application is received, it will be farmed out to a group who will reach out to you. So there will be a contracting officer possibly to reach out to you. It may be a buyer who reaches out to you. It may be someone in services, a services business manager. If it's in the food industry, and in the coffee industry, we have an entire food group. So that food group may reach out to you to talk to you. Because we're broken out where we have all of these different directorates, what we'll do is find out where it belongs in the company or where we see the best fit, and then we'll take it from there. So in information I think you should know, FOIA applies to the exchange. So anything you do with the exchange is open to FOIA. And I'm going to just point out some things in our agreements that you may or may not question as you start to read agreements with the exchange. The EEO acts all EEO compliance is required in our contracts and agreements with the exchange, as well as the Service Contract Act, which actually spells, spells out how you do employment with your employees. We actually work with the Department of Labor, and there's some labor rules that you may have to comply with when you're conducting business with the exchange that you may not actually require when you're out with some commercial firms. So I just like to make you aware of that before coming in with us. And so these are some dues, send us information. We are compliant with the Department of Defense Armed Services Exchange Regulation, so that's who we follow. And that helps guide how we as a retailer set up our business as a complete opportunity. Don't. Don't send us lots of unsolicited samples of merchandise. Again, that goes to our sample warehouse, and then it usually gets sent back to you. Because again, we're dealing with hundreds of companies across the globe, and we get lots of things sent in daily. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> So if once the so source list application is farmed out, what we'll do is we'll reach out to you when it's the right time for you to come in. It's instantaneous for a lot of companies to think, I must fly to Dallas to go see you face to face. You don't have to come see us face to face to do business with us. We like to say we want to make sure your P&L statement stays, stays strong. When it's time to come fly into Dallas, we'll invite you to come into Dallas so you can actually present to us. If you're in a local area, it's easier for you to go out and see the local services business manager and learn a lot more about the exchange. In fact, I'd encourage that. Susan and Mark will probably do the same thing. 
I'd encourage you to visit the Hill Air Force Base Exchange and look at some of the opportunities that we'll talk about because seeing is believing and it's good for you to see to fully understand how it operates. So failures to respond to solicitations or pre-solicitation notices, that says basically you're not interested because we do a lot on contract. We will send out contract solicitations. The exchange is a strong believer in a competitive effort and competitive environment, and it's one of our DOD requirements, is that we are competitive as an organization. So what we'll do is we'll do like an RFP, and we'll come out and say that we're looking for coffee operators, since you brought coffee to the table. If we're looking for a coffee service, we will then go out and solicit for coffee service providers to name brand national services and small businesses. We'll look at all and then have you compete for that contract. Let me caveat that, but what uh, Denise is discussing here when you do talk about solicitations and that sort of thing, she's specifically referring to services, um, the services side of the house or uh, purchasing expense items, construction, that sort of thing. I'll take up the retail side um, in a few minutes. It's, it's a different animal whenever we're talking retail procurement. After we could spend an entire day, we'd be going through each of these categories and there's some little differentiators in each part. So I will say to you, you'll learn the overview here, but we'll give you more detail as you start to inquire about doing business with the exchange, which we hope all of you will. Denise, question. What's the difference between a partnership and a contract agreement? Partnerships, we're just saying that it's a contract agreement with the exchange. We don't truly go into true partnerships as the word is defined legally in partnership. Because I know that makes a difference if you're a lawyer. <laughs> Our, on the retail side, that's a good question that, that starts with this. On the retail side of the house, we talk about partners. Um, we don't discuss contracts because we're a retail organization at heart. On our side, um, we don't do solicitations. Um, we have an item, you sell me a widget, you show it to me, I like it, and I will place an order for it. So we refer, we tend to refer on the buying side of the house as vendor partners. Not vendor contractors. It's an important distinction legally for us. So, if you look at the types of opportunities with the exchange services, spending is one, and I'll go into that in a few slides in a moment. Construction and contracting is another. Architect and engineer services, AE firms, is another opportunity. Support service contracts are another opportunity. We'll go in and spell out what those are. Telecommunications, if you're a telecommunications provider, we've got opportunities there. In order for the exchange to operate, of course, we have all of these malls and shopping centers worldwide. We need the support mechanism in construction and as well as in telecommunications efforts. So we bid out all of those jobs. So that's opportunity for the exchange that you may or may not consider as an opportunity for you. Information services, IT contracts, we bid out for a lot of those as well. And then, of course, other e-commerce contracts. The two, two groups that aren't mentioned on here are retail and e-commerce, which Dan's going to talk about in just a few minutes. <coughs> so services and vending, so I'll speak specifically about the shopping center component of the business. In there, we include barber and beauty shops, taxi, shuttle services, rental car, we cover any category of business you can actually think of. So afterwards, if you stop by, we've got a brochure that tells you some of the businesses. This tells you the countries that we actually operate in and gives you a little bit more insight to the company for the services and vending in the shopping mall portion of the company. Nutrition centers, we do business with GNC throughout the world. So if you've not been into an exchange shopping center and you haven't been into an exchange mall, you may be surprised to see that we're doing business, just like you would see at one of your local mall retailers. Type of stores, amusement machines, and so on and so on. We have red boxes. We operate over 27,000 vending machines around the world. So if you're in the vending business, we invite you to do business with us as well. So those are all avenues of business that not everyone considers because we are like a well-kept secret club shopping group. That's how I define it to other retailers when I talk to them. Yes, sir. Oh, I get it right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mic check. I'm sorry. So you're mentioning the drop by and watch the exchange stores. So is it easy for a small business to So that's perfect for my club shopping comparison. Do we have that? You have to have an individual ID card to get into the installation, or you can reach out to the services business manager to say what business you're trying to tell us about. And, yeah, and, and what we've been doing is go through your PTAC uh, regional rep and tell them you want that service. You know, you want to go see a basic chain and see what they sell in there, see what the prices are, see how the uh, kiosks are all set up. Um, usually that uh, referral will come from PTAC to us and we all escort you on base to do that. Okay, thank you. Or if your business is talking to us, then you can reach out directly to the exchange and the exchange will then make the 
correct uh, alliances for you to get into the installation and into one of our centers. So let's imagine this is our shopping center. So I will tell you this happens to be the shopping center at Fort Newton from Lee, Texas. We just opened this year. So this gives you a little bit of insight to some of the brands you see in the mall. So this is just one business opportunity for you is the fact that we have Wandering Cowboy GNC. You'll see name brands that you see commercially outside the gate. You'll see Texas Gifts. That's a small to medium sized business that happens to be from the Colleen area. So the same thing is applicable here at Hill Air Force Base as well as throughout all the malls throughout the world. And that's in Europe and Asia, as well as in the US. So each of these stores, the storefronts, that's one opportunity for you to consider. You can become a store operator or attendant on a military installation if you have a specific product you're trying to sell. And there's many products back there I see. And I know it's frustrating to send them to new markets. And there's an opportunity there for the exchange. It's frustrating if you have to go out and be physically present, but you can bring in your staff and run that store as one of your outreach, outreach opportunities for you as a business as you start to grow. So there's great opportunity for you there. If you think attached to this mall, this is our primary mall entrance here going in. If you, at the top half of that, and this wasn't enough screen to get it all on so that you could visualize it, I want you to visualize with me there's a big anchor store. That anchor store is our VX or PX, and that's where everything we buy in there is directly wholesaled and directly procured by the exchange. Everything we have in the mall is taxable, and there are third-party tenant operators operating those businesses in the mall and the shopping center. Down the middle of this mall, what you don't see on this chart, which we'll tell you about, is our short-term kiosk opportunities, and we have kiosk carts, RMUs, retail merchandising units throughout the world. We have over 10,000 of these units, so it's another program. If you're trying to find out how does the marketplace do with my product, this is a great opportunity for you. Because what we do is a percentage revenue share for these kiosks. You can come set up for two weeks, sell your product directly to the military customer, see if it's a viable business proposition, build some sales, and then present possibly to our retail box because then you have some history to present with. If you're brand new starting out, you need somewhere to build history. So our short-term kiosk program is a program we think is great for small businesses and mid-sized businesses. And so now, without me talking further on services, I'll turn over to Dan to talk about the retail box and our e-commerce site if there's any questions on services and all that stuff. Other than demand, what is the criteria that you folks use to determine what are the products and services that will go into the, uh, into the exchange? Dan's going to talk for the box itself, and that's top of his list. And then for the, for the sources in the mall, we'll consider everything at any time, depending on what the niche market requires. So I always encourage every small business approach to exchange because we're just a great opportunity and a low cost opportunity for you to come into the business. What's the best way to make sure our application gets looked at? If you send the source list application to our headquarters, it will be farmed out to the services team. We see those. I will tell you, we have a lady at headquarters that's farming some of those out, so we'll look at those for the services. So department. once she looks at those, does she base her decision on whether or not they contact us just on the application? It's always good to do a follow-up, depending what avenue you want to go in business with. What I suggest is you keep your, we ask that you keep your source list updated annually in our system. What happens is buyers and as services operators will go look in that system and see if there's somebody offering the service we're looking for at a specific time. How can you make sure if you mail in your application that it's been looked at, that it's in your system, that it's something that... Somebody you can send us a follow-up email, and I'll get the email address as we go through. There's a way for you to follow up and see if it's in the system. So, so we can... And if you're in doubt, if you're not getting any response, you can contact me directly and we'll go from there. I mean, will you get a response either way? We're not interested in your products right now. We've seen your application. No. Or we'll contact. We'll contact you if there's interest. Only if there's only interest. Only if yes. So if I make, if I send in these applications over and over and over again, it's futile. As, as long as you're keeping it updated, as as Denise said, once a year, then then you're in our system. We're required to look at them at all source list applications. I guess in here is another answer to your question. We log them they're far, as they're farmed out to the individual buyer or the contracting officer. We're required to review each of those and, and uh, log them. But you're the only one that would know that it has, in fact, been looked at, especially if I just mail it in. I have no way of knowing whether or not my application has been looked at, whether I'm being considered. It will be looked at. We're not, going to, we're not going to tell you, but yeah. we're required, internally as an organization, we're required to look at all sorts of list applications. We're not going to tell you, but yes, we are required to do that. <laughs> right. If Which we, is why I said don't get frustrated with the system, because you're going to send it in, and then you may not hear from us, and then all of a sudden we decide out of the blue, we're going to do an RFP for this type of service. 
We're going to go out to that database and look at those sources of applications that are current. If you're in there, what type of business do you have? Gardening tools. Gardening tools. So if you're in gardening tools, we'll go out and look if we want to open either a storefront in the mall, we want to look at short terms, what do we want to do? We have a procurement team at headquarters with a contract inside that will look at that database and then they'll say, okay, we're sending RFPs to these people because they indicated interest in that source of application. On the buyer side, you may have to do a little bit more perseverance and follow up to reach out to our buyers. This, this is an important <clears throat> distinction, and this is why you get these kind of questions. Sure. They're used to being able to go out and fed, fed biz ops, and they see an opportunity and say, okay, I want to bid that opportunity. Whereas I think through APES, what we're saying is we do the source list application, then we have you in the system, Correct. and then it goes to the appropriate buyer. When they're buying your product, then you should get a solicitation sent electronically. For the services and vending piece, for the procurement piece of purchasing direct and store, which is what I'm thinking you're suggesting you're trying to do is wholesale bargaining tools to the exchange. And I'm going to let Dan talk there's, about that. There, there's three arms to this. You can, you can picture it this way. Denise and I are two-thirds of, of the arms. Um, we basically deal, I deal in retail, she deals in services, which is just another version of uh, retail goods. There's a third side, which is, as we mentioned, it's expense um, items, it's construction, <coughs> that sort of thing. That's a more formal federal process. There are solicitations that are put out. For those, they'll show up. It's not my expertise. I don't know for sure, but they show I do know that they show up on federal solicitation requests and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming that the majority of people here are interested in either goods and, goods and services in, in, in some form, you know, <coughs> retail, retail or services contracts. So the question came up, you know, on the retail side of the house, how do we determine what we're going to buy and from who? Well, at, at the heart, the, the division that I work for, the merchandising directory, we're retail buyers. Um, I have a federal contract and officer's code, um, which essentially is a fancy way of saying I have a checkbook. I can write checks that obligate the, the federal government, um, particularly, specifically ACES. But after that, it really becomes a matter of we're retailers. If you walk in and you have meetings with uh, Academy Sports or Walmart or Target or any of these other big box retailers, my side of the house operates a lot more um, closely to that. What we're looking at is source list applications. They do come in. We review them. Um, we look at trade magazines. We go to shows. We go to trade shows. And I'll go out. In fact, um, some of my buying people, oh, by the way, uh, I buy specifically, I buy automotive toys, sporting goods, and military clothing. So I mentioned 1.5 million in, in uniforms. That's my team. We do that. Um, so I can speak specifically if you have questions about those categories, toys, sporting goods, automotive, or tactical accessories, hunting, fishing, that sort of thing. Um, but we go to trade shows. And as I was saying, my sporting goods team um, just recently visited Salt Lake City. We went to the outdoor retailer show. That's a very good venue. It's an expensive venue for small businesses. We recognize that. But it is a good venue for us because it lets us see products laid out. It lets us talk one-on-one. -on -one. Um, trade magazines, industry magazines, and shopping our competition is also an important part of, of how we find um, products to bring in. Essentially, what we're looking for on the retail side is what any other retailer is looking for. We want something that's new, innovative. We like name brands. We like everybody else that retails. We want name brands in our stores. But we also want new innovations, new products, particularly in some of the categories I buy, like sporting goods, tactical accessories. There's a lot of new products and innovation that comes onto the market that we don't necessarily see right away. That's why for us, industry magazines, source list applications, and one-on-one -on -one conversations with suppliers are important. Um, slightly different from, again, from what uh, the services side of the house and, and the purchasing expense side of the house do. We don't maintain supplier contracts. We have purchasing agreements, um, which is a fancy way of saying we have certain terms and conditions that apply if, you, if we decide at some point to do business with you. We're going to give you a terms and conditions. That's on the website that we'll show you in a little bit. You can go out there and you can look at it. There's another link on there that says supplier handbook. It basically lists in a lot more legalese, detailed views and don'ts and what's required to do business with us. Um, on our side of the house, uh, say you have a solicitation or, excuse me, a source list application, um, or we met you at a trade show and we like your products. We're going to talk with you one-on-one. -on -one. <coughs> We're not necessarily going to go out and say, 
you have garden tools. So I like your garden tools, but I have to find five other sources, potential sources for garden tools. I'm going to look at your garden tools. I'm going to look at if I happen to find a trade show for from other sources, and I'm looking for those categories. I'm going to compare like any other retailer. I'm looking at quality of goods, what the customer's wanting, what prices you're offering, and what terms. So an important part of our agreement on the retail side is a business terms agreement. As I said, we don't have contracts, we have business terms. And that's as a small business owner, that's one of the things that you need to think about if you're interested in doing business on the retail side of the house. Is what are your business terms? What are you going to offer me? What do you require out of me? Things such as freight terms. One of the big um, issues that comes up, or the first big questions that comes up from small retailers or small suppliers is I decide I like your product, I met you at a trade show, your widget's the best thing I've seen, I need to buy 150,000 units and I need them in Germany, Turkey, Okinawa, and Korea in six months. Can you do that? What are your freight terms? Are you, am I going to pick the goods up? Are you going to use UPS or FedEx? How are we going to do business? How are we going to distribute your product? Are you more regional? That's fine. What's your area of distribution? That's, that's what I need to know. Um, another aspect of that business terms agreement is the allowances. It's a standard retail practice, standard, um, standard in the industry to talk about marketing funds. Your small business, you may not have a lot of money, but maybe you can give me a volume rebate. If we sell a lot of your product and we do much better, let's set a target, a set a performance goal. Or do you have a marketing budget? Are you going to have somebody out in the store, if I buy you regionally, are you going to have somebody in the store that's going to demonstrate your product? How are we going to market you? How are we going to get, I like your product, but I'm just going to stick it on the shelf and hope it sells? Or are you going to work with me and partner up and help me move your products so that it works for both of us? When we, when we talk about what we're looking for on the retail side. Yeah. You, got, you got a question. Yes. Sorry, you, you mentioned that. Uh, when, when somebody comes and approaches you with a product, and you've got to go out and find other sources of, of a similar product. So, you know, talking about like gardening tools, you have to find five other companies, or whatever, that also have those mm. those same kind of things. What What if your product is so unique that you can't find other sources? What is that kind of a dead end, or how does that work? No, that's that's a good question. Maybe I, I burned past that much quicker than I should. I don't have to do that. I'm not, a, I'm not issuing the federal solicitation. If you, if, if you have John's widget, and I like John's widget, and John offers me a fair price and can meet my terms and, and my requirements for business, I can do business with John's widget. I don't have to issue, issue a solicitation to see if anybody else makes John's widgets. Now, there are particulars to that because, you know, on the buying side of the house, I am a federal contracting officer. I have to be careful. If John is representing, say, one of my old categories I bought, I bought cosmetics. Well, there's Revlon Cosmetics, but there's a lot of people out there who sell Revlon Cosmetics. So I may make a distinction and say, John, are you a primary source for this item, or are you not a primary source? Are you a distributor? There's differences, and it impacts how, it, it impacts how I'm going to do business with you. If I, can get, if I can get John's widget, if I like John's widget, or I can get John's widget from 10 other people, then I may go out and I may solicit, I may request input or, or, or you know, it's called whatever you want, presentations from other potential suppliers. But if your product is unique and I like it, I can buy it. I don't have to solicit. I'm, I'm a retail buyer at heart. If I like your stuff, I'm going to buy it when I write you a check. The details of you know, a lot of these details, though, that, that paint up small business, uh, small and medium-sized business owners that want to sell to the exchange is the, the back office systems. Something else we talk about when we're talking about distributing your product out. I, I decide I like it. I tell you, yeah, I need X number of units. Uh, I'm going to distribute it out here. We come to an agreement on how it's going to get there, the freight terms and that sort of thing. You're going to offer me a volume rebate or some marketing funds or anything like that. Then there's back office systems that we need to think about. If I'm going to continue to do business with you, it's not just a one-off deal, but I'm going to do, continue to do business with you, are you EDI capable? Small business owners, uh, anybody here EDI capable? Does anybody know what EDI is? 
we got two. EDI, as a big box retailer, EDI stands for Electronic Data Interchange. It's basically a fancy way of electronically transmitting purchase orders. It's not a requirement, but it's really nice. Because on the buying side of the house, I don't have to take, you know, I don't have to cut paper purchase orders, stick them in envelopes and mail them off, and then write you a check and have accounting mail and all that kind of stuff. It's not a requirement, but it is nice. We do we enjoy doing business that way because if I decide I like your product, being on EDI also lets me put it into an automatic replenishment system. So sort of the set and forget it, like Walmart, Target, all these other companies use. If I decide I want to test your product, I may decide to do what we call in, in, in our you know, our side of the house, we'll do a test buy as a one-time buy. You don't have to have EDI, you know, you don't have to have electronic payment formats or anything like that. I just decide, you know what, I like your widget, John, I want to try it. We'll pick, we'll pick on Shelly, we'll decide to send it to Lewis and McCord both at the same time. No, I want my kids again. It's an inside joke. <laughs> um, so we, you know, we decide we're going to agree what, what your, you know, where your product might be best at, and I'm going to place an order. Then you don't need to be on EDI. And if it succeeds, though, if it looks like it's going to have some lag and it's going to move, and I want to want to talk to you about some of those back office systems. You know, I don't require all these things, but let me tell you what, as a buyer. If you're not on EDI and you don't have electronic payment, the accounting people, they start knocking on my door. They don't, they don't like paper checks and all that kind of stuff because it slows the process down. Um, part, of, part of being uh, in a big box retailer, UPC codes. Um, that's a, that, you know, in fact, I probably should mention that first. If you don't have UPC codes on your, on your products, then it's probably going to fall into like a services kind of kind of thing where you're going to have a shop or a kiosk or something like that. I have to have UPC codes. Mm -hmm. All of our systems, all of our systems are based off of the UPC code like everybody else. And if I don't have one, then you know, I, I, there's not a whole lot I can do. It used to be you could, not anymore. We're 21st century retailer like everybody else. There are other opportunities on the retail side of the house. We need to mention e-com. Ecom for us is huge. Everybody knows everybody's Walmart, Amazon, Target. Everybody's trying to get online. We're actually outpacing the industry on our ecom site. We're going to do $250 million this year as a conservative estimate. $250 million just online. That's a good opportunity for a small business, particularly if you have your own website already and you ship on your own. We call those dropship vendors. We you do self-fulfillment. That's, that's neat. We like that because for us, it's, it's simple. We can go out. We can say, you know what? I'm not sure about John's widget, but I know there's a customer out there. John does vendor dropship. I don't have to mess with it. I just code it into the system, and I stick a picture online, and I look with John on the tag words, you know, the keywords, and that sort of thing. It's idiot proof for me. I can set it out there and see how it does. That needs to be test the products. So if you're... When you're filling out a source list application, or you see one of us at a, at a trade show, or you talk to me after the, after the conversation, if you're interested in e-com and you have your own site, or if you just say, you know what, I'll drop you. I don't have my own site, but we'll put it out there. I got it in, you know, shop. I can box it up and stick it in UPS. Let us know that, because we're <laughs> always looking for those unique things. That's what's important about the web. You know, the nuts and bolts, the, the everyday stuff. Anybody can find anywhere on the internet. But what, what we're really interested in on the buying side is those things that fill a niche and not, that are going to draw our customer in, because then we can get them into our website and grow our customer base. Sir, you find that your customers, the military people, are beginning to go to your e-commerce site first, or we're going to an Amazon or or someplace else. Uh, I would I would say yes. Um, we relaunched our site last. October. It was it was it was very clunky before. It's, even the econ folks were back. It, it was not a very very well thought out site. We relaunched it in November, and I said you know we're experiencing 15 to 20 percent growth this year on top of the 25 percent growth last year. 250 million dollars. Um, our customers are tech savvy like everybody else, and they like that they like that sense of ownership. <coughs> that Denise mentioned we're a community. We're part of their benefit. 
They, they know us, they expect us, they trust us, they hold us to a higher standard, to be honest with you. Um, and so our e-com site is, is, if not top of mind, I mean, you know, you think of Amazon, I mean, you think of Amazon. But, you know, our, our site, we have 700, I just updated the number with e-com folks today. We have 722 distinct dropship vendors, just dropship vendors on our site right now. That accounts for about 55% of our total online business. Um, the other 45, 40 to 45% we warehouse, um, we stick it in our warehouses, our distribution centers, or we fulfill from store. We, we just launched our, our ship from store um, option. Yeah, I've noticed more and more uh, friends that I know that shop AFIs are doing it online. In fact, uh, I wanted to talk to you about any ideas you had about keeping my wife off of that site. <laughs> Well, we yeah. had some back of house issues that we've since corrected last year when we yes. did our relaunch. That's what caused us some issues with the way, so you'll see a big difference in our website. Another thing that you'll hear about, and you'll see in some public trade magazines, is we're going to add veterans online as a benefit. Tom Shaw, our director and CEO of the company, has said that we're going to offer veterans the ability to shop online in 2017. So that's coming forward to grow our customer base with accessibility online as well. Interestingly enough, uh -huh. Um, if, you, if you also kind of want to get an idea of that's the question. Yes. So the online is that like the people that can I shop there? Is it just all government personnel? What's the deal with that? Um, that it, it, I was just about to, in, okay. to address that. Um, with the relaunch last year, um, previously you couldn't even get to our website unless you had um, authorization. Basically, your ears, which is the Defense Department's way of tracking military and retirees. And, those, those active duty people that can shop. If you go to shopmyexchange.com, you can look at our site. You can see your product categories. You can't necessarily see pricing. That's behind the firewall. There's also certain areas like my military clothing stuff, you can't go in because you're not authorized to, to, to buy uniforms. So that site's blocked. The regular retail goods, you can go in and you can look. In fact, in a lot of cases now, um, because of Mr. Scholl and, and our relaunch in November, if you go to Google Shop and you put in some keywords, if we have products, they will show up in the search results. They won't show a price necessarily because, again, those are behind the firewalls. But you can look. And that's a good way of also kind of getting an idea of what categories of merchandise and you know, what we're doing in, in your categories of merchandise. Can I believe you have a question? Yeah. Does everything you sell have to be very compliant? Or? Ah. That's a really good question. Um, he, what he's talking about is, uh, I'm assuming you're talking about military clothing side of the house, retail side of the house. Just clothing in general. Right? Yeah. No, we do not. What, what the gentleman's speaking about is very, the very amendment. That applies specifically to military clothing items. Um, we're like, a, we can sell right. made in China, Taiwan, as long as it meets the, the State Department's list of restricted countries. Or manufacturer sources, we're okay. Military clothing side of the house, um, no, we are we are exempt because we're not appropriated fund. So if you have a tactical item, I see some some camouflage stuff in the back. If you have a tactical item that you think would be great, they'll let you do OCP you know, combat uniform. Yeah, I can look at it, um, particularly if it's a commercial if it's a commercial item. The very amendment would apply to like the specific uniform items, the issue items that come from the DLA. They have their procurement must be very compliant by law. Because we're not appropriated, we don't have to. And I'm going to add to that. So think of the exchange as multiple opportunities. Because if you put in a source of application, you have that long product and you can't get that through our buyers, look at some of the other operators that are third parties in the mall and look at selling to them. That may be your entrance into the military market. Tactical stores is our fourth largest category that we sell in the malls. So that's another opportunity to raise some of those operators that are already in business with us. The same way we're in discussion with Ace Hardware, for example. So we're in some discussion with them right now. So you may end up not necessarily selling directly to the exchange, but indirectly selling to the exchange clients and customers for some of the other arrangements we have. Particularly for small businesses and medium-sized businesses that may not be able to work with everything that Dan's mentioned so far. So think way out of the box from talking to the exchange because there's so many different avenues, so many different opportunities, and we, between the two-thirds part, can't cover all of this today. Yeah, so on the retail side of the house, I guess the, the bottom line is we're a lot more flexible. 
um, you know, as far as, as who we buy from, where we buy from, and how we how we get the products, you know, the product information. We do use source list applications. We're required to review those. Um, we we have a website of our own internally that we go in, we have logs we see, we review it, we put comments out there, so they will get reviewed. Um, but getting to know your product and getting used face to face, that is a hard step. Um, there's a lot of avenues, but it is a hard step, particularly if you're a small business, a small or medium-sized business owner. You know, these shows like the outdoor retailer, they're not cheap, we know that. Um, there's opportunities out there in some cases, like I went to the shop show I mentioned in Las Vegas. Inside the tent, super expensive. We're talking tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. There's a lot of retailers or a lot of suppliers that set up outside. They get their own hotel rooms. Send word out, send invitations, send emails. Part of the nice thing about the Aethis.com doing business is that there's a list on there. There's a tab that says buyers. And I think it does. I'll have to double check. But they changed our titles. So I, I think it's just by category now. By category. Yeah. So there's contact. There's multiple ways of contacting us, and we encourage you to, to reach out and contact us and knock on our doors. You know, and, and the brochure thing. Yeah, don't send those in advance because I don't know who you are. But if I reach out and I'm interested in you and we have a conversation and a rapport, absolutely I want to see some product, you know, some product brochure. I want to talk to you. I want to see your stuff. So us learning about you here because this is such a good networking event. How many of you in here are retailers who do markets, for example? So somebody earlier who does markets today. Okay, so there's just a few of you in that industry. How many of you are actually AE firms or construction firms are looking to do service supply? That's just hands, okay? So there's two of you. How many of you are strictly interested in wholesaling your product and directly giving the big box? So that's the bulk of you. Okay. So that kind of tells us how we're talking. So again, I understand because I know I feel like, have you done a source of application with this man on the landscaping tools? And you didn't get response. That's what I felt from my first conversation. So I think it's not my strength, but I just want to say to you, so don't be frustrated by that. But I felt that just was like, how many months should I wait? Right. So what I would do is just make sure you're annually updated in that system. So then what we'll do is show you how to get to our website, and we're going to actually go there next after we talk construction a little bit for folks who are interested in construction. And then you can reach out to that buyer. Leave a voicemail for that buyer. And again, make sure when you leave a voicemail for that buyer, that you show and tell what it is that's unique about your product that's making you different. Again, these guys are combated with hundreds of retailers every day because for you as one small business in Utah, there's another business in Texas, another business in Cleveland, there's another business everywhere else across the U.S. and around the globe. So just keep that in mind. So don't get frustrated with us. I know it's a very frustrating process, but just keep that. And that's why we say to you, update that source list application annually. Make sure that's updated in that system because you just don't know when we're going to find your niche. Any more questions on the retail side? I'm sure there's a lot of questions. Yeah. And we'll meet with you one-on-one -on -one to learn. It may come through. You may sell one of us your product today. <laughs> and that may be something we have to take back. Maybe I missed it earlier, but is there a financial floor, like like GSA, you have to do 25000 a year. Do you have to do a minimum amount to stay on to stay at the exchange? <coughs> no. It, it, no, there's not. Um, like I said, if I, like, if I see your product, I like the product, I'm going to buy your product. I just got to figure out how to get it out of the market and work with you on it. Sales. Um, in that respect, again, on the retail side, we're, we're like any other big box retailer you're going to talk to. I've got a few more special requirements, but essentially, I'm like a get a buy. So now, plug for services one more time. If you can't give it to the buyer, what happens? What makes the difference between you and the other retailer coming in? If you go and say, Susan, we want to set a kiosk up in your mall, I'm going to sell directly to your customer for a two week period. Get some feedback from the military customer on my product. How much more quick for you to go to a buyer with some feedback already of what you know about the military customer? So don't close all the doors down if you haven't explored the avenues, because it's easy to get to let you get to the big win and the big dollars and the global deal. But it's good to start and grow yourself with the exchange. I'll I'll piggyback off of that because that's that is a very good point. I came here, I moved back to the states last year from Germany. I was in charge of the buying office in Europe, and we did that quite often with small European um, sources where the suppliers for you can't swing a day cap from Germany without being a brewery or in Italy without being a vineyard. So their entrance into I'm sorry, I was technical here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> from people on YouTube. Uh, it was a good entry point for us because literally I, I can't review every single vineyard or every single brewery. It wasn't possible. And so a good avenue for us 
course, the kiosks out in the malls, in Aviano, Vicenza, and Ramstein, and all these bases overseas, where they would work with these local people, <coughs> they would develop a, a following, and then they would turn them on to us and say, hey, you really need to look at these guys. Their, their product is not just regional, it's not just local. So it's a good avenue. There's a lot of communication back and forth between the services folks and ultimately the buyers in the categories. You have the association with the Department of Defense Schools. Do you have there is, is that just a separate animal, or is that a separate animal? It's a separate animal, but through school feeding, we have an association, and through banking, we have an association. Okay, so, you know, the overseas docs system? And, and, yeah. well, what kind of um, discount do you like to see on the prices in the retail store for what we would see in Walmart? As far as retail goes? Yeah, I like that. Our retails, we don't have set standards. Um, there are certain categories where, by tradition, for instance, uh, prestige cosmetics, for instance, where there's no discounting at you know, Neiman Marcus or, or you know, we'll be 20% off every day because we know that there's no discounts. No <coughs> Other categories, we're competitive. We have, we have an overall average savings to the customer, 25%, I think, plus or minus. Overall, is we're, we're 25%. We're also non-taxed on the retail side of the house. I think Denise made that distinction. There's a distinction online too for the e-commerce. If you do have your own website, there's ways that you could be either taxable or you're responsible for sales tax, or you could be non-taxed and, and not break out the bar system. That's that's we. And for the services side of the house, we have an average savings of 10% written into our agreements per month, depending on your category or niche of business. If you're in the fuel business, you're in the health care business, then we're going to look at the Competitive survey pro process against industry and then price according to industry. Yes, sir. Yeah. As a general rule, we find that we're selling on a, on a, to retailers that are taking, we're selling the product at 50% discount off of, off of retail and then it's marked up again at retail. In your case, uh, are you looking for that 50% or are you looking for more than 50% so that you can deal with the additional savings that you're offering to your customers? Um, I'm a retailer. I'll take whatever you give me. Um, is, is there a general rule? I mean, did you start basically 100% markup? We want to know. We're, it depends. It depends by category, by item. We're we're operating off of a, off of a retail price survey kind of format, where in general each category will have will have goals. We have financial forecasted budgets and all that sort of thing. And so the individual buyers will work with their own assortments to come up with a competitive retail price at a margin that meets their, their goals. There's no set markups. There used to be, they're not anymore. We don't use those. Um, and as far as cost pricing, I, one of the requirements, it's not a requirement, one of the things that you'll find in that terms and conditions refers to the Rob, I'm going to get that right, Robin, Robson Patman Act or something. Yeah, Robinson Patman. Robinson Patman. Yeah, which basically, which basically said, yeah, it's based on standard oil of Ohio, 1942, blah, blah, blah. Basically, we're, we're exempt. Because we're the government, you can offer us the best price in the world. You don't have to give it to anybody else. But if you give it to somebody else, you need to come talk to us. Does that make sense? Sort of? Yeah, well, basically, at the heart of our, our retailers on my side of the house, we, we want the best price you can give us. There's multiple ways to do that. There's, you know, or, you know, there's freight terms, there's allowances, you can either give it to me up front, you know, you can give it to me in the backside with, you know, with volume discounts and that sort of thing. Um, we're all up for creative ways of, of making money and, and helping you. It's another thing we pride ourselves in is the flexibility of deal making. So once you get to the discussion phase, then it's on you to make sure you're dealing with the best deal and the best fit. And that depend, doesn't matter what part of the company you're talking to, whether it's services, retail, or e-commerce. So we'll go quickly to construction before we, we go to the more. website. Do we have another question? Um, no, one more question. Bulk item. Do you, do you work on a linear footage? I'm, I'm sorry? On, on box items, do you work on a linear footage? Um, so, sorry, do you have Oh, so, we, have, we have like financial standards and performance yeah. standards. Yeah, if, if you wind up being, um, we talked about either your basic item, I decide to put you on a replenishment, or you're a one-time buy. I have performance standards that I'm going to expect. I think that came up with the John's widgets a bit more. Sorry, I don't know what they're selling, but 
the gentleman asked the question. We we're talking about John's wages. Yeah, if you if you come in, <laughs> uh, I have I have performance expectations because I have a, I have a budget. I have a I have a it's open to buy budget. I have a amount of money that's set based on my forecast and sales and my inventory standards and how much money I can spend. So if I decide to take a, a, a try a test on your product. Um, I decide, you know, I'm essentially deciding internally I'm going to take money and not give it to this person. I'm going to give it to this out of here because I feel strongly. I will expect that, you know, performance standards to be met. If you're an inline item, a basic item, and you get added to a planogram, which basically is a schematic that tells the story where everything goes, you're on top of the punishment, then yes, I also have standards because I do annual or biannual, you know, or multiple times a year I'll do a, a product review. Top of bottom. Every buyer does that in their categories. And if your item is selling really great, you may expand distribution. If it's not, I may go find somebody else's with you to put it in the place. So, what was your linear footage? Oh, it, it'll it it'll vary by by department, by buyer individually within that. It's you know, there's no set standard. And you mentioned about the uh, ways to compensate. Uh, discounts or sure. analysis mm -hmm. and marketing. What about the, you, you mentioned about the sampling product. It's going to be easy for a small company to send personnel to sample products on the regional or national level. It's just one option. I, I don't I don't know your particular company. Coffee. Coffee. Coffee? Coffee. Coffee? coffee? Yeah. Yeah, if you want to sample coffee, you know, <coughs> you decide to, and I don't buy food, but, you know, they do samplings all the time. Um, you can either do that yourself. If you if you decide to go the services route and have a kiosk to test at Hill and, and around the area, you can arrange and schedule samplings there. Um, if I decide to do it in all of Western Region or all of Conus, um, that may not be feasible for you. You may not have somebody who can visit all 50 states. You know, um, and so, you know, but that's not the only way to, to do it. You can you can you can I suppose you could pay. If it's internally, you could fund us to have a sales associate stand out there and sell your coffee. I don't know if that's been done before, but obviously why not? It's just marketing funds. It's just it's just transfers of, of, of your marketing funds. Sir, in the past, um, could you tell me a few ways that you've been able to overcome the issue with having a, a unique product that you may really, really like, but um, the rest of the world that's buying you really doesn't understand? How do you overcome that um, that particular problem? That's you know that's a tough one. Um, it's persistence is what I've seen. Um, there, there's a lot of different ways to get your product in front of the buyer. You know I've mentioned several of them. I'll, tell you, I'll, I'll give you an example. I was at the shop show in Las Vegas. Uh, it's a tactical retailer shop. Um, guns and knives and ammo and everything you can think of. I found one thing I was really hot on it is just like the best things in sliced bread for my categories military clothing quiet velcro mm -hmm. quiet velcro who, who would have thought quiet velcro i'm wearing a uniform i got a, you know a, a extra ammo pouch on my molly here i don't want to you know for it <laughs> <laughs> the guys the guy was standing literally standing in the middle of the aisle blocking walking traffic demoing quiet velcro and he forced me to stop. And I was like, that's the best thing I've seen in the whole show. And this was in the stands. This was like, it was like thousands of vendors there. It's just persistence. And, and I'll be honest, our, our buyers are individuals, they're people. Um, some of them are, are really hot on new products. Some of them have been buyers for four years and you know, they're not, they, their categories are pretty set. And product samplings, brochures, Persistence of reaching out and getting a response to the hey, you know, getting that buyer, getting them on the hook, I guess. You know, from the buyer standpoint, Denise gets the same thing. We get, I kick open the doors every morning, there's people wanting to sell products to me. You gotta get me on the hook. Mm -hmm. It's persistence, it's brochures, it's product information. Getting your foot in the door is difficult. My concern with you is after I show you our product, you're gonna fall in love with it. We just gotta <laughs> 
so much of a way that we can introduce it to everybody else. <laughs> so guess what? Today we're taking some extra time to talk to each of you. So this is your opportunity to talk to the two of us while we're here so we can see that. So I think as your small business assistant, we want to go into construction and then we want to talk to each of you one on one if you're interested in doing so. And so we welcome you to present that product. And I know some of you have made the effort to brought your products so you can see today. And so we can talk about different avenues of how we think you can approach the exchange and what we've got and where we think you can go. So I think that would help for some of you. And again, in food, if you're looking at food, we do prepare for food. I work in the services food directorate, so I will tell you, cover through every major restaurant brand that's out there, we're providing through the exchange food services. So don't limit to what you think. If you think you're in doubt of who you're doing business with, we're probably doing business with most major retailers in some capacity or the other somewhere throughout the exchange. So just don't limit yourself in thought and persistence is key. I totally agree with you because it's the same for services. Another show that we use and we go to a lot is the ICSC, the International Council of Shopping Centers, and that's where all developers and specialty tenants go. So that's another place for you to consider. And the vending, NAMA is a show that we attend you routinely annually. So, so construction and construction contracting, of course, for all those beautiful shopping centers and malls that we have to design, we have to build them. And we have our own construction teams. We bid out. Most of our deals are over 25,000. So if you're interested in construction, the source list application is the same, but we send you to a different part of our, our actual website. So when we go onto the website, we're going to show you, and we've had lots of internal discussions on how easy it is to navigate the website if you're a small business. And it's not the easiest in the world, but we have a separate category for construction, a separate category for retail, a separate category for services, and a separate category for e-commerce, I believe is the fourth one out there. So there's different categories depending on what your niche in the market is and how you approach us. <coughs> so again, types of partnerships, AE firms. If you're an AE firm interested in doing design drawings for us, we bid out that. We do some bids on bedbizops.gov. So some of our bids will go out to there. It depends on what product we're looking for and how big the project is. So our real estate construction team can talk more in depth to that. Support service contracts. For all of those facilities we operate, we require janitorial services. We require electrical services. So again, not knowing, but I know there's a few of you in here who are in that industry, then consider us for that as well as an opportunity of putting in a source list application. For uniforms, freight, we have our own logistics firm, but we outsource a lot of logistics requirements to support our logistics warehouses around the world. Customer service support contracts, ring sizing, things you just don't necessarily think the exchange is doing, we're somewhere in that business and an outreach program of some form. And then we do consultant services to study different elements of the exchange because we are competitive in the industry just like any other retailer, so we have to make sure we're forward thinking and forward advanced in our approach. And so we like to go and use those services as well. Other types of partnerships, as I said, telecommunications, downrange in our contingency locations, so in Iraq and Qatar and some of those areas, we will outsource for our telecommunications for the deal. For the troops, where the troops are, our goal is to support them. So if they can't call home and the military isn't able to provide that service, then the exchange will step in and provide that service. So we put the telecommunications business in downrange. We have television satellite services we offer through the mall. So you think of a category, like I said, we're in it. And high tech. Telephone systems, we have phone systems, we have a headquarters in Dallas where we're all at, and you can actually sell to us for our corporate headquarters in Dallas as well because we require a lot of infrastructure and support there as well. And that's pretty much our presentation. Quickly run through. Does that give you a little more insight? Let me ask you a question. Does that give you more insight to who we are as the exchange and help you understand us a little bit?